بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم my dear students this is ڈاکٹر محمد شفیق اگین دا لیکچرر آف فلاسفی ڈپارٹمنٹ آف اسلامک اینڈ پاکستان اسٹڈیز کسٹ اینڈ دا کورس کو کورس آئی ایم ٹیچنگ یو دس سیمیسٹر از کالڈ کلام اینڈ فلاسفی آف اسلام اینڈ دا کورس کوڈ از آئی ایس ایل فور سیون ون دس از لیکچر نمبر ٹین ٹوڈے اینڈ وی آر گوئنگ ٹو اسٹارٹ ٹو لک ان ٹو اینڈر برانچ آف فلاسفی Uh, which is very important in the context of philosophy and that is called epistemology and today in this lecture we are going to see what does knowledge mean what is knowledge called and how it is important in the context of philosophy so we are going to look into what is knowledge and what does it exactly mean As far as knowledge is concerned, so the branch of philosophy that discusses knowledge is known as epistemology. So it is the field of epistemology which discusses what is knowledge, what are the types of knowledge, what are the sources of knowledge. We have tripartite theory of knowledge and lastly we have Edmund Gettier cases which is actually a criticism of tripartite theory of knowledge. Now, let's move to the next slide. Now, what does knowledge mean? The very word knowledge is derived from the very verb to know. Often, when we say we have knowledge, we mean that we know about something. We have an intuitive grasp of the concept. But in philosophy, there is a rigorous debate. It is not such an easy task to define knowledge. There are different philosophical views about knowledge. We have different types of theories. We have idealists. We have materialists. Uh, the skeptics have their own perspective about knowledge. We have phenomenalists. We have coherentists. So all these group of philosophers, they have their own views about knowledge. What does knowledge actually mean? Now, what are the types of knowledge? So we have basic three types of knowledge. One is personal knowledge. The second is uh, propositional knowledge. The third one is procedural knowledge. By personal knowledge, we mean knowledge by acquaintance. When we get familiar about a person or about a thing, then we have a personal knowledge of that particular person or an object. So, for example, if I say, I know Mr. X, here I mean by, I, here I mean by know that I have a familiarity, I have met him, I have a sort of acquaintance with Mr. X. The second one is propositional knowledge, which is related to facts. If I say, I know about Mr. X, here I am referring towards those facts about those information that uh, Mr. X is a student of philosophy, Mr. X is pursuing his higher studies, Mr. X is uh, an intelligent guy. So all this information makes proposition knowledge. The third one is procedure knowledge, which is not usually applied to persons, it's applied to objects or things which means how to drive a thing or how to juggle out a thing. For example, if I say, do you know how to ride a bicycle? Or if I say, do you know how to drive a car? So here, actually, I am referring towards those skills or the procedure that is involved in driving a car or riding a bicycle, which means that do you really have the skill how to apply the brakes or how to control the steering wheel or how to apply the clutch. So all these skills constitute procedural knowledge. Next to it, we have different sources of knowledge. First 
important source of knowledge is sensory organs. We have different sensory organs like we have vision, uh, we can see things. In our eyes there is retina and most, uh, and uh, whenever we see an object, so the light which is reflecting from that particular object uh, falls on our retina and there are some receptor cells in our retina and the, those receptor cells uh, change that physical energy into kind of neural impulse that is known as transduction. We can say it transduces that physical energy into a kind of neural impulse and that neural impulse is sent then to the brain. We have audition as well. We can hear things, same as the case with audition, we have receptor cells in our ears, we have smell, we have touch and we have taste. So in all these sensory organs we have some specialized particular types of receptor cells that tran transduce that physical energy into a kind of neural impulse and then it is sent to the brain. This whole process is known as sensation and later on this manifold of sense data is organized by our mind and our minds give it a meaning what we call it perception so it means that perception is actually a kind of organization of the sense data so we can say whenever we have a perception about something so we have the sense data so sensation without perception is blind and perception without sensation is empty. We have another source of knowledge that is reason. By reason we mean the faculty of knowing which is a very important source of knowledge. Often we apply our reason, the faculty of knowing. Uh, we compare, contrast, and analyze things. So it's a kind of reasoning. Next to it we have other sources like traditions, authorities, intuition, and revelation. Tradition is a kind of knowledge which is transmitted from one person to another person. So, in fact, most of our social knowledge is preserved and transmitted through traditions. For example, if a person wants to get knowledge about a particular community, so he or she would be studying that folklore of that particular community or by studying the stories which are prevalent in that community. So it is a source of knowledge and we know about that particular community by those prevalent stories or folklore. It may be poetry or it may be music as well. Next to it we have an authority. Now what does an authority mean? By authority we mean when one has a specialized knowledge or an expert view about a particular area. We often have authorities in different uh, areas of knowledge. We have authority in the field of science. We have authority in the field of philosophy. For example, Einstein, Albert Einstein is an authority in the field of physics. And often we rely on their opinions, on their insights, uh, those scientists, they are actually a kind of authority for us. Same is the case with philosophers. We have Burton Russell, the famous philosopher of the 20th century. His insights, his uh, aphorism can be taken as a source of knowledge. Next to it is intuition. Now what does intuition mean? Intuition is basically a kind of knowledge or awareness of something without conscious attention or reasoning. In philosophy we can say the power of obtaining knowledge that cannot be acquired by others' inferences or by observation or by reason or experience. It is, not considered, it is considered to be an original source of knowledge. Uh, when you become aware of some phenomena or when you become aware of some fact suddenly in a flash of light, that is known as intuition. But there is a group of philosophers, they disagree for some philosopher, it is a combination of past experiences and knowledge that results to a sudden insight or a solution. 
it's not very much sudden, but it's actually our past experiences, our past knowledge is working in our subconscious mind and suddenly it comes to the surface of our conscious mind, then we call it intuition. Next to it is revelation. Sorry, be before revelation, I deem it important to give an example about intuition. So, we in logic or in mathematics, we have this kind of knowledge that is known as intuitive knowledge, which is not dependent on experiences or observation, which is totally independent of experiences. We have those postulates or axioms of mathematics. We have some necessary truths of logic of which we become aware suddenly and those facts are in fact not the result of uh, other experiences, they are self-evidently true, a postulate or an axiom that is self-evidently true and that is not dependent on that, any other experience or observation, we may call it a, a kind of a priori knowledge. Next to it is revelation. This type of knowledge is related with religions. In religion or theology, revelation means uh, revealing or disclosing a fact of some form of truth through communicating with a deity or other supernatural entity like God or it may be an angel. So we have different religions like we have Judaism, Christianity and Islam. They have their own holy scriptures and they believe that uh, they are revealed to their respective prophets. For example, Jews uh, believe that Torah was received from Yahweh on the biblical Mount of Sinai. And the Muslim believe that Quran was revealed by God to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him word by word through the angel Gabriel. Same is the case with Christianity. Next to it is tripartite theory of knowledge. Now, basically tripartite theory of knowledge was propounded by Socrates, but it was made public by Plato and his famous book that is known as Theatetus. According to tripartite theory of knowledge, knowledge is a justified true belief which means that in order to know about something, or in order to have a knowledge about something, these three conditions must be met. This is the criteria. That is belief, justification, and the third one is truth. So the first thing is belief. Now, I am sitting in front of a laptop. Now, if I say, I claim, if I claim to know about laptop, if I say this is a laptop, first of all I must have a belief about this particular object that is laptop. Secondly, I must have a justification. The justification may be that laptop is a machine through which a person can compute or can prepare a lecture uh, which is different from desktop or a palm top or from a cell phone and that justification must be true as well. As far as truth is concerned, truth is really a debated concept in philosophy. There are different perspectives to truth. But here by truth I mean, uh, I will take truth in the sense of correspondence theory of truth. That my statements, if my statement and the actual state of affairs, they are telling with each other, then uh, my justification is true. Otherwise it is would be false. So. Here I am using this machine and I am delivering, I am preparing my lecture, so it is true in fact. Next to it is, what is the criticism of Edmund Gettier uh, as far as this theory, tripartite theory of knowledge is concerned, there is a famous philosopher Edmund Gettier who criticize this theory on the basis of his two famous cases that is known as Gettier cases. He actually uh, published a paper which uh, was uh, published in 1966. I have, I am sharing that paper in the KCMS account as well. Uh, so in that paper uh, he has, he had a thought experiment 
the first case is that knowledge without a belief he compared to stu students the students are one is mark and the other is same they both appear in the exam as far as mark is concerned he is very much studious in nature he always prepared for the exams and he takes the classes regularly and on the other hand same is a student who is most often absent in the class and he doesn't work hard so the, so they both appear in the exam uh, after attempting the qu the paper both comes out of the class and as far as same is concerned same says that his paper went out in total disgust and for mark the paper was something very brilliant they discuss that paper with each other and afterwards same makes a belief and that belief says the student will get the highest grade in the exam who shares name with the author of the adventure of huckleberry finns because same things that some of the uh, some of the questions they were actually very much related to that book that is the adventure of huckleberry finn and the author of the huckleberry finn was mark twain so it means that sam had a belief that mark will get the highest grade in the exam but afterwards what happens when the paper was checked by the examiner the examiner gave sam the highest grade why because same has written a few lines but he has but he he was able to elaborate the whole original point of the question uh, while on the other hand mark was not able to do that now what happens about this belief the student will get the highest grade in the exam who shares name with the author of the adventure of huckleberry finn so again uh, that belief becomes true because Mark Twain was the pseudonym. The actual author of the adventure of the Huckleberry Finn was Samuel Calliman. So here the student that was named as Sam shares with Samuels. So here Gettier says that sometimes we have a belief and we have a justification and that justification turns true as well. but still we cannot call it knowledge knowledge is something more than this the second case is that of a st student who appears in the exam and there was a question mcq's question that the battle of hastings occurred in 1066 ad and the student is supposed to tick it whether it is true or false now the student sticks it true when that student comes out of the examination hall uh, he's asked by other students do you know about this or do you have any belief that it is true so that particular student neither has a belief nor he has a justification uh, nor he knows that whether it is true or false still his mcq's question is considered to be true now here get here again says that sometimes we don't have a belief we don't have a justification and still we may have a knowledge so that is knowledge without a belief so from this discussion it is obvious and get here has showed that tripartite theory of knowledge may involve a very uh, kind main wall a type of luck It, it it things become true by luck things become true miraculously in a sense so gatier criticized the tripartite theory of knowledge in the basis that knowledge is not something that could be defined as a justified true belief it is something more than this in the coming lectures we will be discussing what are the other epistemic theories about knowledge what is rationalism what is empiricism what is reliabilism what is foundationalism and what is anti foundationalism we will be trying to have a, a comprehensive uh, view of what is knowledge so thank you very much indeed